Guys, what's up? It's another Rand Cash Short. And once again, I'm loving on this signature spot. And I love the kind of things in wrestling that are important to them. Because these are the important things. I'm tired of hearing about Vince's mustache and seeing his bald spot. We love CM Punk, where we're going to cry when he shows up at AEW. And then a year later, we hate CM Punk because he's not a big proprietor of the slappy kicks. But anyway, the Road Warriors, man, that's something that is just one of the biggest things in the history of pro wrestling. And it was undeniable because we'd never seen anything like Hawk and friggin' animal man when that iron man music hit the place went bat shit of course they tried to bring him in as heels but it never ever worked because those two emmer effers were just too damn special the first time i saw the road warriors it was 1984 and it was a cross promotion between Vern and the Crockett's Chicago at the Rosemont Horizon on a Sunday, a project that did not even last a year, sadly, called Pro Wrestling USA. And I felt horrible for the quote unquote baby faces at the time, a young Kurt Hennig and a young Scott Hall, because it was absolutely no way, shape, or form. They were going to get over in Chicago facing the Green Road Warriors. I would venture to say that they were all in the business about the same time. And, uh, you know, not that Kurt and Hall didn't work their asses off, but when Kurt took that special bump where he was tied up in the ropes in his head and his father came out to make the save, they booed Kurt and Larry the Axe Henning, which that had never been done before. So, back to something that you didn't know, even if you're old enough to remember that or if you're old enough to remember the Road Warriors when they first broke in, or if you might have even been alive at the Rosemont Horizon, which is now the not the United Center, I've all State Arena, and uh, you saw that Pro Wrestling USA product. Here's something you didn't know: Mike Lima and Barry Fox. They were legendary promoters in the Midwest, and they were Chicago promoters for the World Wrestling Federation. And then they later became the promoters, the Midwest promoters and Chicago promoters for World Championship Wrestling, WCW. And at the time, what they ended up doing, they're working for WWF, was they figured out that, and this was all Mike Lima in his 20s, that we can't get on paper an exact exclusive on the venue. What can we do? So what they ended up doing was... They had written in each contract that wrestling could not follow WWF, WWF events that they had scheduled and put together for a certain amount of time, thus giving them a legal exclusive on the venue. And I'm going to say at the end of the day, that is in part what hurt WCW, because when you're on television, you have that strong a product like WCW had and WWF, WWE had. Yes, location, location, location can hurt you. Also, did you know that the Road Warriors were the original spokespersons for Zuba's brand? Yes, in the 90s, everybody and his mother's brother were wearing Zubas. All the wrestlers in the entire world were wearing Zubas and fanny packs. It spawned so many generic Zubas that you could go to any bar, any gym, and somebody was selling these Taiwanese knockoffs out of their trunk, man, but people didn't care. They were white hot, and they were gigantic in Japan, where we all know the Road Warriors were considered gods. I mean, actual gods at one point. Can't imagine the amount of money that they made being part owners of Zubas. You know, now they're re-releasing Zubas with the NFL, but it's not working like it did, man. Like I say, everybody was wearing those until Joey Buttafuoco came along, and that put the kibosh on it. And the Road Warriors, under the advisement of someone, were smart enough to dump their ownership 
in Zubas in 1996. All right, as Luke Williams of the Sheep Herder slash Book Whackers would say, mate, get to the meat of the potato. I don't even know what that means, but I have an idea. So here's the meat of the potato, mate. Vince wanted to get his hands on the Road Warriors. WCW did everything they could to keep the Road Warriors because acquiring the Road Warriors would definitely move the needle in so far as how business went. Like I said, you have no idea how over these guys were. You had to be in that building and you had to feel it live to really understand what I'm talking about. But eventually, he was able to score himself the Road Warriors. And on that first taping that they were on, I was part. I was there, part of the uh, non-contract crew doing jobs as enhancement talent. I was a young guy in the industry. Now, usually going up there, if you knew how to watch your P's and Q's and keep your mouth shut, and you know, you knew your politics. It was always an enjoyable experience for me. I enjoyed being there because I got to learn so much while I was there. And I was going in there at the time with a guy you might know from AWA and WWF and part WWE televisions, Tom Stone. Well, Tom Stone is most notably known for doing jobs because he was so goddamn good at it. But Tom Stone was a worker, man. He did his time and worked full-time for the Kansas City Territory for Bob Geigel, and he was just a plethora of storytelling in that ring. I can't tell you how many guys, young guys especially, that were on that WWF slash E roster that would go to Stone to fill in the blanks for them when they were too afraid to go up to those crusty agents like I.E., my friend, former friend, rest in peace, Chief J. Strongbow, And Stone would walk them through it, and it would make sense, and they would get over. And then sometimes that green guy would work Stone, and that would really get him over, leaving no room for error. Well, because of that, Stone doesn't sell it. He never really used it to his advantage. To be honest with you, now that I think about it, that Barry Horowitz push was originally supposed to go to Stone, but Stone didn't want to do it. But anyway... So it's uncomfortable, man. Demolition is there. The Steiners are there. The Nasties are there, okay? And it's quiet. It's uncomfortable. Nobody's saying much, and then that's setting the pace for the whole thing. And this is before the cameras started rolling or the doors were open. People are going in and out to do promos. The Road Warriors are getting the lay of the land going to do this promo wait a minute though it's not good enough go back and do it again as they're walking in and out of this big locker room and i think we all changed in like a cafeteria setting and i can't remember what venue that is but it's something in the midwest after about an hour 90 minutes of uncomfortable quietness tom stone yells out guys it's okay The Road Warriors now know it's a work. And then everybody in the place is 100% even more quiet. You could have heard a mouse fart. And then Hawk looks at him and says, you know what? Fuck you, Stone. Then the whole place breaks into laughter and it broke the motherfucking ice, man. It was outstanding, you know? The other thing is, what makes it even funnier, is I would say the first six, half a dozen or so, uh, enhancement matches on WWF programming, they made sure that Stone was taking that Road Warrior finish. Just kidding. They never heard him. They were too strong. So many people tried that Road Warrior finish. How many times have you seen him try the Road Warrior finish from then till now? Nobody gets it right, and there's broken shoulders and separated necks and all that other happy horse shit. The Road Warriors... They were there. They were solid workers. They could beat the shit out of you if you if they wanted to. But uh, they could work. They just laid it in, and that was their gimmick. And as a result of said gimmick, the rest is history, man. Etched themselves in top guys in the annals of pro wrestling is something that had never been done before and hasn't been done since. All right, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed this Rancast short. Please like, subscribe. 
And look at the description and how you can support Premier Pro Wrestling.